And so the library hosts this weekly discussion because we believe that everyone should have access to information, whether or not we necessarily agree with the information. Um, so I do ask that hopefully we'll have a lively discussion, um, but that everyone be respectful of everyone else's opinion, whether or not you agree with it. Um, at the end of the session, there are these wonderful little slips that I would ask you to take and just go to this address and fill out our survey so we can learn more about what you all would like to see every Thursday during the quarter. So next week, we will be having Nat Steiner who will be discussing um, segregation in South Africa, parallels and implications. But this week, we have the Director of Public Safety, Alvin McLean, and he'll be discussing personal safety. Um, protect yourself, personal safety at Seattle Central College. So everyone, give a minute. <laughs> Um, thank you, and thank you for, when I was asked to do this, or I was asked, I think it was an email, it was an email, it was an email, it was an email, it was about safety and security around Seattle Central, <coughs> and I, it was, it was a joke, but somehow I got put first on the agenda, which is fine with me. Um, <coughs> I've been here now, and I just looked at the calendar this morning, uh, come this Saturday, it'll be my third, Saturday will be my third year here, <coughs> and in the three years that I've been here, Seattle Central Public Safety has changed a great deal. Um, when I first got here, our, our department probably wasn't the world's greatest team players, and they were kind of like individuals we here now with the team. My first day of school here, and I'll give you a little background on that, is I started the day that the Army Blast was coming down the Fraser Valley. So I came into work on time like a good state employee does, and we opened late that day, and I didn't get notified. Um, so I sat in the parking garage and I started walking around the campus, walking around the garage and seeing things. And I actually found an open door to get in, which is not good for the director of public safety to do. And I got into the building and I started to wander around a building I didn't know. And I actually got lost in Seattle Central for a few minutes until I found the security office. And that afternoon we closed at 1 o'clock for the flayed Frazier Blast that dumped snow for the next week and knocked power at my house in Snowfolmia. That night at 11.56 we had a homicide on campus. That was my first day of school. And it's been that active ever since. Not that we have homicides every day, but that was my first day of, of here. Um, my career in the Seattle area, King County area, in 2001, I became the emergency coordinator and a public safety officer at Bellevue College. That started my career up here. I've been in higher ed for 32 years. I am a lot older than I look. Uh, I was a campus security officer as a student, making $3.35 32 years. Um, and I just work my way up. I like working for the state, people think I'm crazy. I like doing my job, people think I'm crazy. But I think it's a good job, it's a fun job, it's an ever changing job. I'm a very hands off type of director. My officers will do what they need to do to get the job done, and I support what they do. We have changed our uniform, we have changed our, our look, and we have changed our philosophy. We are on a customer service model for where we are out there to serve the community that we are. We are entrusted with, and our community is kind of unique. I mean, the Bellevue campus of the world is a campus. It's 100 acres, 20 surface parking lots, six-story parking garage. It's pretty enclosed. Seattle Central, I have buildings across the streets. My geo map of this campus for crime statistics actually takes in a lot of businesses because I can't say they're not part of the campus. I can say the park isn't part of my campus. <laughs> But, you know, it's kind of hard to say where our lines are for this school. So, when we talk about your personal safety, I can say with about 90% certainty that on any given day at Seattle Central itself, you can feel pretty safe. Our, is our issues and situations are when you leave the school, or if you go walk to lunch, or if you go out at night if you're an international student, what type of precautions should you take or can you take to better protect yourself from harm or from whatever should happen to you in the world? Uh, last year, I spent this time last year in a lot of international program classrooms talking about that because we had international students that were being vandalized, being victimized. We had an international student that was shot in the leg. We had an international student, about two international students that were victims of strong arm robberies. They didn't happen at campus. They happened at their home state or at a venue, but it does impact us because there are our students. It comes back to campus and people talk about it. So how do you protect yourself here? 
You see something suspicious, you say something. Uh, you see it when you go to the airport, you see it when you go to the train station, you'll see these signs of Homeland Security will say, if you see something, say something. Seattle Central will most likely be the first community college on the West Coast to join that program because I am liaison with the Homeland Security Office for other things. I think we're going to actually be a pilot program for the area for see something, say something in higher ed. I think the University of Washington is going to beat me, but as a community college, we'll probably be the first college to and what that means is you'll start to see posters hopefully soon around springtime, late spring, pop up around campus that will actually say, if you see something, say something, and it'll actually have our phone number listed, have an 800 phone number listed, and also 911 So if you see a package that's been sitting in a backpack that's been sitting by the door for a while, perfectly, if you see something, say something. If you see a bag sitting unattended for a while, that's what it's all about. It also goes to people. I know we have some unique people around this campus that aren't students. But if you see something that just your sixth sense tells you that it doesn't feel right, call us. I mean, we have an astronomically large call load for years. When I first got here, we got very little phone calls from people feeling uncomfortable. I think today we have an average of about 40 phone calls, 45 phone calls every day that come into us for someone saying, this just doesn't feel right, it doesn't look right, <coughs> this car doesn't look right, Weird things. People think they're weird phone calls. But my officers go to each one of those calls, or I go to each one of those calls, and we take a look and try to figure out what's going on. So we have a much better communication with our college community today, I think, than they did in the past. And that was one of the reasons I was brought in here, because I truly believe in a community-based type of program. I can't do it all. <laughs> I'm a state aid. I'm a state department within a state agency within the state, and I have very limited budget. So I asked the community to help us. And whenever I talk to faculty or staff meetings or students, I enlist your help because we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, I try to be out of my office as much as I can, to be out wandering around and helping my officers out as much as I can. But sometimes I have to do meetings, I have to do presentations, I have to go see people. You know, we need to, we need your help. I mean, there's only six of y'all in here, but we need your help. And so, if you can help us. Help you, that would be great. How can you protect yourself here at Seattle Central? I hit on it a little bit. <clears throat> if you see something, say something, call us. <clears throat> if you are a victim of a crime, <clears throat> this is my website. <clears throat> if you are a victim of a crime, you need to report it to us. Uh, not just because of the statistical reasoning of it, but we do need to know what's going on. And I have a crime, I have a crime program that actually can track crime. So every year I can actually, or every three or four months, or every month, I can pull up a little chart that shows me where a lot of thefts are happening. It happens a lot in this area <laughs> for some reason. It happens in the library and the atrium an awful lot. Um, <clears throat> but we can track those crimes and we can actually make up hot areas for my officers to spend more time in, walk through more often. So we do take the information we get very seriously. The other reason you need to report crime is, according to the federal government every year, I'm supposed to report crime to them under the Clery Act. And you probably, you all probably know a little bit more about it now. It's probably called the Violence Against Women's Act, the Campus Save Act, is now part of the Clery Act. And we have two things out of the Clery Act that you can look at actually on my webpage. And one of them is the crime statistics, which will be popular. And it looks kind of scary, and it's not really that bad. If you actually look at it, you're going to see the homicide that I talked about right there, and that'll go away next year. What Cleary says is, <clears throat> for the preceding three years, I need to report all crimes that happen within my geo-specific location of my campus in Seattle Central. So I can tell you that the sex offense fondling was the incident that happened last spring at a Broadway performance hall that I got to be on TV for a week with, because I totally hate being on TV because the video adds 20 pounds to you, <coughs> and I'm already 20 pounds overweight, so that makes me 300 pounds. Um, <coughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it happens, so it gets reported. I do not report this, I get fined. I don't get fined, this, the college gets fined. But it's $37,000 if I don't report that fine. We don't report Ouch. that. Um, we had you know, three aggravated assaults last year. We had some fights that were off mouth. Part of our students, most likely, I don't think they were, but they were on the campus commons or on the campus area. 
and they were reported. Our biggest crimes that we do have on campus are, as you can see, burglary. We have a couple cars coming out of the parking garage every once in a while. But the largest crime you will ever see that gets reported on this campus is larceny. And larceny is theft. And I can say of those 53 crimes, probably 40 plus of them are out of a place that we're sitting very close to called the library. It's, it's a crime of opportunity. If I leave my cell phone sitting on a table out there and I go into the book stacks to get a book, I come back, I can guarantee you nine out of 10 times, my iPhone's gonna grow some legs and walk away. If I leave my iPad sitting on a table in the atrium to go get a cup of coffee, and there's a group of people sitting at the table, I give it 80% certainty your iPad's probably gonna grow feet and walk away. It's a crime of opportunity. So we need you to be aware of that. We need the people of people of the community of the campus to be aware of that. That number, I hate to be a, a pessimist, I <laughs> always be optimistic. That number will never go down. I can talk to orientations all the time. I can talk to new employees all the time about this. And I did a study a long time ago when I was at Bellevue as the assistant director. And 1% of the people I talked to would be victims of contenders because they won't believe it. And I did the study for a whole year when I was assistant director there. And it turned out to be almost 2%. They just don't believe it. And our biggest vulnerable population is our international population, and then our student population, and then our employee population. Employees, are, it's a little bit harder to get to us because a lot of us stuff is through a door, through a door to our office. But sometimes when we go out to lunch, you know, we can leave our purses laying around, leave our jackets laying around. My fiance had her credit card stolen out of her wallet we just found, found out about. We don't know when it was taken. We kind of think an 18 year old in Arizona might have it, but we're not sure. Um, her daughter. But, you know, and we don't know how long our credit card's been missing, so we have actually killed the credit card that the 18 year old has. Huh? Um, but, you know, if you leave stuff out and about, there used to be a crew that worked the I 5 corridor when I was at Renton, and they they would do a distraction in an office, someone would slip down the hall of the office, find open office doors, and they would literally pull credit cards out of ladies' purses and out of men's wallets and not take anything else. Okay, I have, four, I have four credit cards in my wallet that I know about, that I love, that I won't use anything else of. I won't get any more credit cards in my life because I don't like them. If I'm missing a credit card, I'll know it. If you look at Deb, as I like to pick up my fiance, she's got 12 credit cards. Uh, she's got eight for her business and four for her personal. And so I don't, you know, I don't know how she knew one was missing, but she did. So be aware of that. If you see people that are suspicious in your area that you don't know, you know, I, I don't look suspicious, but I've been questioned every once in a while walking through places. <coughs> Ask, you know, can I help you? Is it the world's greatest thing? And that way they're on notice. Uh, I, you know, I'm looking for the restroom. <laughs> something, they'll say something stupid. Um, ask them, not really confront them, and just be very polite and say, can I help you? Are you lost? Why are you back here? You know, I'm going to call security. Probably would be about the fourth thing I would say. But. Give them a chance to express what they need to express, and then if they start to act suspicious or hinky, give us a call. If you don't want to make contact with these people, give us a call. Um, my officers will respond, or I'll respond, or we'll all respond. It's our job. So be aware of your surroundings. But like I said, the largest crime we have here is, is the largest name. We do get vandalized every once in a while. That's when we get tagged up. Um, we do have some shouting matches. Those are the simple assaults that happen on campus or just a little bit of a touch. <coughs> it's hard to believe we're on Capitol Hill that we have liquor law violations, but we do. Uh, we do have a little bit of you know, drug, drug law arrests that happen around the campus as well. Some of these stats do not reflect student or non-student. There's a stat, they're just stats that happen on the campus itself. I don't have to differentiate the stats as student, non-student. I just have to differentiate the staffs as on campus, on campus, off campus, or public property. So, and I do this every year. Um, the reason I, I'm pretty knowledgeable about it is I'm one of the 24 instructors from the nation that teach Clery, and so I'm pretty well up on the Clery, the Clery Act and the Violence Against Women Act. I need my glasses to be too old. <coughs> 
Any questions so far? A lot of information. Yeah, I have a question. Right in the story. Okay. So um, at, a, at my old college, they in the library, I know that there are a number of uh, if, you know thefts. And so what the staff started doing was like having like, these stickers that would say, like, you've just been swiped. And so when they would walk around and see people's property, it would be like a little note saying, your stuff could have gotten stolen. And I don't know whether or not that actually had any effect, but do you know whether programs like that actually make any difference? At three colleges that I was at, Three colleges that I've worked at in my career. Uh, 1980, <laughs> in 1981, I was a student security officer at Clark College in Beckley. It was known as Clark Community College at the time. Um, I'm really going to age myself because I made three dollars and twelve cents an hour. Um, and through the progression there, I actually became their director later. About 1987, I became their 87, 88, I became the director of public security there. And I left there in 97. Um, and I was a part time cop. In uh, we had a thing that we had a form that was called Lock and Lose. And what we did to the campus was that we found an office door open. My officers would actually have a book, they'd pull it out, they'd start writing this thing and say, D for here. And they'd walk in, they'd leave us someplace conspicuous in the office and the person for the owner of the office said, We found your door open, we found your purse, blah, 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 please keep the door. And what we would do, we would actually send a copy of that to their boss. So now the employee's been notified, the boss has been notified. If my officers, we I had a three strike for a work. Um, if my officers found this office open three times in a row, my officers were, as a bad joke, my officers were somewhat sarcastically comical. They would steal something. They would literally take something out of the office, take it to the employee's boss, Give them the lock and lose it, write the report, leave the item with them, and leave in St. Andrews. Because the next time we're going to come back and we And we'd actually sit down and have conversations with people. We never got to the three strikes. There was a couple people that tried to. We had a few people in Clark that wouldn't listen to the numbers. But when I came to Bellevue, my main job there wasn't that. My main job was enhancing and correcting their emergency management program that it was hired for. But when I became a senior officer, and then when I started working my way into the assistant director's position, we had that issue. We'd walk to the library, and there wouldn't be anybody at tables. And, you know, stuff. and so we would just start scooping stuff up and taking it to the circulation desk. And then, you know, students come up all pissed off. And so I'd rather scoop and have it someplace safe than leave it sit and have it be a victim. When I was at Renton, you know, you're talking about 25, maybe 5,000 students. The library are really, really small. Populations are really small. The populations really don't get together a lot of us technical school. We tried a few things there. Uh, the Lock and Lose we used there. Uh, public open forums we used a great deal there. Um, the Lock and Lose did start to work an awful lot of things with the faculty because, and the employees because they just don't, you don't think. You know, I'm on my way out, I'll be right back. Well, you, you know, Kelly or Liz walks out, and then all of a sudden ends up talking to the students. Well, I'm not right back, not the office is standing up being a lot longer. From my office, you have to get by my front counter and two officers. Then you have to get by Pink Gilman, which not too many people can get by 10, to get to my office. Okay, so I, I have a little bit of defense to leave my office door open. <coughs> this place, if we weren't here, I, I could do a lot of stuff as a criminal. That's what I'm Director of Security, I think, by the Colonel. But, you know, if you had little forms that said, you know, you find your iPad, you know, the circulation. Mm -hmm. And if you have a continual problem, then, you know, we can talk to students too. Mm -hmm. I don't want my officers, we have a hard enough time now doing what we do to where we are up here actually enforcing those rules. But yeah, the library actually started thinking of ways to help the students, that's great. I can tell you that probably by summer, all of your cameras are going to get replaced, I think. I mean, I've been watching the emails go back and forth through procurement right now, and it sounds like it's a done deal. <laughs> and I think the cameras might be coming in during the spring break. So this old camera will leave. Most likely there won't be a camera here anymore. It's going to move out. I mean, you're going to have less cameras and more coverage. It's just kind of a weird way to think about it. But newer cameras cover a lot more than these cameras. And they'll be in better locations. And the plus thing about that is they'll never have to look at film again because <coughs> it goes to my recorders. So everything actually starts to come to public safety. 
So yeah, we are making some enhancements to the library. And once we get the cameras set up to where we're comfortable to where they're set up, then we need to do some urban design stuff for crime prevention the library, moving book stacks, moving walls. We're raising and lower things so we can actually get a better sight of what's going on. So that will be the next step after the cameras. And then access control for the next step after that. Because you're one of the final <laughs> locations that are on metal keys, and I'd love to get you off that. So <coughs> that way we have audit control over the guard keys. I carry no keys. Everybody thinks it's funny, but my key is my wallet because I have a card key that I just want. <coughs> she was hiding in her office. I thought she was I'm listening in there as I'm checking my email. So now we cannot sneak, sneak in her office and steal anything because I was going to send one of you and then it would be a criminal for me, but don't worry about it. I'm just joking. So, yeah, just talking about the library. Those are the ideas that I've had. You know, it's taken us three years to get cameras over here. It's taken me three years to get cameras on the outside of the campus. Um, but, you know, that's one area, you know, I have areas, I have a fifth floor that has a standalone camera system that's been failing for the three years I've been here. I have a Broadway performance hall that's been on a standalone camera system for longer than I've been here. And the only way it stays alive is whenever we tear out one of those old systems, we get Daryl the pieces and he continues to fix the system. This me be DH and come my system anytime soon. But, we try, I try to get a, you know, I have no money, so I buy more on steel, uh, and I just use those type of words. But your question, going back to it, yeah, if there was some way that we had a little piece of paper that you just put on the desk, or, you know, you know who was, you saw the student leave, it's not a good idea. You know, something like that, but you have to get over that fear of talking to people, you know. I'm pretty good about talking to people, and to let you know, when I take the Myers Briggs, I'm an introvert. I'm an I. I'm a big introvert. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm an instructor, and I still freak, not frequent, I still see classrooms left open. Mm -hmm. And um, I have closed them, and then I've re told Harriet about it. But mm -hmm. also, I have actually seen instructors walk out of classes and let the new just kind of just walk out, mm -hmm. and so their classroom is, uh, has students in, or new students are coming in mm -hmm. for the next class. Mm -hmm. What What is your... I've talked to the Senate. Mm -hmm. I've talked to the instructors. I've talked to my boss. I've talked to the former VP of Instructions and Student Services now. I haven't talked to White Point. Um, <coughs> but there have been many emails talked from to Harriet these, about it. And there's been emails from Harriet and I together. I mean, I, I don't believe in email. Um, I'm kind of, my future 10 year old son calls me old school. I believe in this, see, having a face to face conversation. And so what'll happen is for me, when that leaves the classroom, the overhead projector, and God, we haven't had one stolen in two years. Uh, <coughs> but when that leaves the classroom, and you were the last one that was audited on the door as if being open. The first one I come to is say, when was the last time you were in the classroom? You were going to tell me, well, I was in there at 10. So now I have a window from 10 to whenever the door was closed at midnight, which is the truth, they normally get all locked at 10 o'clock. But I have a 12 hour window. And that's what happened on a couple of our internal thefts after the sand building got hit really hard a few years ago. Um, they started ripping off literally ripping them out of the ceiling in this building. And what had happened was people were leaving the rooms open like you were talking to. And so we went out and did a real real hard push on it and I was out in the hallways an awful lot walking up and down the halls closing doors and pissing people off and people were asking me who the heck I was and I turned around and see my dad and they go, sorry. But you can't teach without that or that. And the only way you're going to protect that or that is to close that. And so that will be my, my quick conversation with instructors. Um, Harry and I try to try to do as best we can. I try not to be a jerk, but you're looking at $3,500 labor included to replace an overhead projector. That's projector, rewiring, new case, and then hour to put it in. But it must be hard when one class is leaving and another one's right there at the door. Well, here's right? my, here's my, here's my, here's my, here's my response to that one. The instructor tells me that you close that door, that I know you close that door, and when she comes up. Her card, she now becomes responsible for that. Right, right. 
You know, I very seldom unlock Same. doors for instructors because of simple fear of they're going to leave that darn door open. I did one yesterday going to a meeting at 2 o'clock and I felt very weird doing it. But she said, you know, I'm a, I'm a sub teacher and for this teacher for the day and blah, blah, blah. So I just walked through the door and then I called Ken and said, Would you challenge? Because it's my suspicious name. But that's what happened. Um, but yeah, if we can get into the opening and closing the doors, which is real, it's not that hard of a thing. You're the last person. I was taught as a kid, you're the last person out. And we but they're the already doors. coming in and people are going out. We could set the door up if we really wanted to be really jerks about them in our program. That every hour at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock, the door alarm would go off. The door's not closed. I mean, we could do right. that. Each door has an alarm on it. <coughs> but the whole building would be chirping and then it would drive me crazy, drive me crazy, and then I get complaints. How do we fix this? I don't know. Um, there is a card out that's a proxy card that looks like a photo ID that as you walk in and open, well, I have no problem telling students or, you know, if you Students have, shouldn't, I mean, according to the rules, I believe in the black and white rules, um, according to the rules, students should not be present in the classroom without instruction. Right. right. That's no according problem. to the policy and procedure. You know, the heart of the rule and the intent of the law, and there's a lot of gray area there, and, you know, we, I live in the gray area an awful lot, but, you know, do we have three classrooms out in the hall of 30 students blocking the hallway from egress and entry, or if there's an open classroom without anybody in the left of the ones that are taking their seats and getting ready for classes here on the block. It's a gray area. You know, if you're running late, I'm running late as an instructor, you know, would you rather have your class waiting outside? Because I know right now in the email, not that I don't like it. Not that I hate it. Uh, I'm in an email world right now about access with an instructor who doesn't have keys, who shouldn't have keys because they are Um, <clears throat> so, there's that fine line, too. I, mean, I don't want students staying out in the hall, blocking the hall, because we have to evacuate or shelter in place to get into some place, and I'd rather have them always do Do we allow them to go in classrooms without instructors? We do it. Even though the laws, even though the rules say we shouldn't do it, we're not supposed to do it, we allow it. It's, it's a culture that we have to shift to and change to. And I believe in change, but I believe in glacial change. In other words, slow change over time instead of we're going to do this today. It's in the little segments. I, I, I'm not a firm believer of shoving things down people's throats because I get pushed back. But if I can have classic examples and have continual conversations, we can't, we can't have change. Bellevue, when I was there, everybody wanted to have keys. Bellevue is a very unique campus to where all their classrooms face the courtyard for 90% of them, and they're on an A and B level. Each one of the classrooms is an individual key. There is over 373 classrooms that face the courtyard. There is over an average of five instructors per classroom, and each instructor wanted a key. <coughs> my mind says that's about 2,000 keys. Uh, my key guy told me on the average it about $6 a key, or the key blank. And he threw in his hourly rate to make the key. It would cost $2 million to make those keys. We made them. Because if we ever went to a shelter place lockdown situation, the instructor needed to be able to lock the door. Because I wasn't going to put a different type of lock on And they don't have key cards. Oh, no. I, if you ever went to Bell, they're thinking about doing card access, and the only way they can do it is wireless. And that costs about three times as much as normal. Yes, ma'am. I have some more questions. Um, have a seat. Do, should I? I feel yeah. I like to stand, but it's all right. I'll have a seat. Um, one, we don't have key cards in the library. So you came in late to my paper. Did you talk about that? Oh, I'm sorry. Just okay. Then What's happening is you're getting cameras. You're probably going to get cameras. Well, I know about the cameras. Hopefully, spring. That, hopefully, spring. Honest. You're getting cameras. Um, you're one of the last areas that don't have card access. Right. And what we're looking at, and it, to expand upon that a little bit, we used to have to go through a contract to do it, and that's expensive. We hired a person part time that used to work for the door company that actually stored a lot of our card access here. Well, he went to work for another company, 
and that for some reason we hired him part time and somehow through the state magic he now is a full time employee for us. So now what we do is we buy the equipment, the hardware, and Jason goes out and installs it. <coughs> we had a meeting this morning about door access control. It wasn't about the library, it was generally the whole mm -hmm. thing. And I looked at Jason and I said, How much? No, Jason, I thought my Jason. Mm -hmm. I said, How much is it going to cost for the parts to do the library? He goes, just the cost for the readers. He goes, you know, the doors are already this, we got to buy the pens and blah, blah, blah. And so there was a conversation today. As part of the integration in here, I want to get the cameras getting her first yeah. and get the cameras pointed. And then we got to do some urban design stuff out there about the height of this stuff so we can actually shoot a lot, of the, a lot of that. There was a conversation, I think, last year with a group of us about accessing the quiet study rooms and controlling that. <coughs> that could be integrated into the access control. I just need to head out and everything calms down. <coughs> and after I spent $500,000 for other cameras and stuff, um, we need to readdress that. Yeah. And then so if we can get you in there. get you more money? Well, it's not. Have you come <coughs> I have no money. I, just, I, I, I go steal. I go That's steal. what I hear you say. I and beg borrow steal. Have you written a, a proposal to the student? Um, student to leadership. Them? Some of the things that I've asked student leadership for kind of for, for the longest time until this year, uh, fell on deaf ears. I think now that there's a change of leadership over there, mm -hmm. uh, things will actually start to talk about. Which, what I propose to, what I'm finishing up is, I wrote a memo of understanding that I haven't given to them yet, it's about AETs. Um, when I left, I didn't talk about my credit in my previous places. When I left, right before I left Bellevue, I wrote an MOU that's still in place today at Bellevue that says, if the College of Public Safety has it, then we'll buy an AED student government would buy an AED on matching program. <coughs> when I left Bellevue, they had six AEDs. Three were bought by us, by my department. I budgeted every year as assistant director to purchase a certain number of AEDs. And three were bought by student government. <coughs> uh, an automated external defibrillator, heart starter. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have one in the light. So what I, why I'm saying that is, is I left Bellevue in I left Bellevue in 07. So eight years later, every building at every major area in Bellevue, and the gym actually has three now, which had zero. Every area that they thought needed one or should have one has one now. And every, the MOU is still in place. The Pfizer is a really good friend of mine. He's the director of student programs there. And he's going to honor that to the day he retires, and hopefully it'll be grandfather. But that was an MOU I wrote. So I have that MOU, I've actually tweaked it a little bit, and I'm going to have a talk, I'm going to be set up a meeting with Maggie to talk about a couple things mm -hmm. that I think are good initiatives for the college and for student leadership to partner on, and a little bit good for the school and everything. AEDs on every floor, AEDs on every floor and every end in the middle. So you're looking at five floors, 15 AEDs, to augment the current AEDs we have. <coughs> An AED that is stored in the public safety officer's office to carry, an AED on every floor in the back, uh, an AED in the bookstore and the student government, and probably put an AED in every like, outside building. And then the same building, main floor, and probably down mm -hmm. too. So, <coughs> you know, that's a program I think we do. Smoking's a big issue. <laughs> you know, I have, came from a smoking meeting yesterday. <laughs> and uh, we're not getting it's smoking, no, we're right. not getting smoking <laughs> shelters, but you know, that was an idea was that you know, the college bought a smoking shelter with student governments because you know, 80% of them are just working on this campus and they're causing big issues right now. And the rain is coming, um, it's gonna cause a bigger issue. So maybe the students could put up for one and we could put up for another. So there are initiatives out there. I have to pick and choose though. You know, access control in the library, it's not a student issue, it's more of an institutional issue. So where do I get the institutional funding? That's easy. I talk to Chuck and David and Irvara over in facilities and say, these are the projects we need to look at. And can we get some more equipment money dedicated to door locking hardware and access <coughs> control? You know, Chuck will push the money that way to that so we go out and buy the parts. Jason gets paid state salary plus overtime. He's our in-house guy that knows how to do it. He's cleaned up a lot of things that were issues that were tired since he's been on the road with us. So, the long answer to your short question, uh, long, short answer to your long question, I will put it, we will get it taken care of. It'll be done in-house. Um, it's cheaper. We just need to buy the parts. As far as the camera system goes, there was no way to find the money. 
wife almost just like me. We went to the budget thing last year and I asked for money for some UVAC chairs and some other things that train for my office. She said, I got it. She asked for the long sum for the camera system. She got it. And so now we're moving forward on that. But you'll see some great changes on campus much more. I mean, we'll have emergency call towers outside, the cameras on them. We'll have call boxes on the outside of most of the buildings. The garage will have cameras in it by this fall. There'll be call boxes on all the landings that are connected to the public safety office. So if you're having a problem in the garage, you can just push a button. We'll see a location or hear a location on the radios. And you can talk to my officers as things are happening. There'll actually be a blue tacophone tower on the fourth floor of the parking garage holding cameras. In. And yeah, we're, we're exterior wise, we're going to have a lot of things. We're actually adding more cameras to the inside of this building. <coughs> to go along with that program for the project. And it's <coughs> money that's been there for the three years I've been here. We just haven't had a chance to spend it. <coughs> so. How about more lighting? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, they are, they are working on the, the lighting on Harvard will be completed probably by the end of this quarter. Of Harvard? On Harvard, on the backside. <coughs> if you go out there at night right now, all the way down the facade until you get to the end of this building. So yeah. All those lights have been replaced with how high mercury halides. They've fired up, they've actually got the two lights on top between here and the BPH are now functional. And we are now, you can actually look at the bookstore. We are actually repositioning the lights on the bookstore and turning them back on. And the apartments have no problems with that because it actually helps out with their tenants and our population at the same time. So yeah, we, and we've, we've replaced all the lights down the back side of the MAC two years ago and that was helped out by the city on the nickel thing. Mm -hmm. Because the city, Hunter management that runs that whole building gave some money and we gave some money and it was all state property that got fixed. And mm -hmm. the fence we put back there was paid for by us to keep the homeless away from them, away from London. Do you um, talk about the security survey that was done recently? Mm -hmm. Oh, the state one that Heather put out? Yeah, did students take that as well? As I don't, that was a state survey, not, that, was, that wasn't a survey that was uh, done by us, it was done by the state, and I think it covered all 32 colleges yeah. and universities. I didn't have a chance to go in there and look at it very deeply. I know that Chuck, Jeff, and I did a <coughs> administrative services, services survey last year through Karen Weiss, down from the district mm -hmm. before she left. And I think the number, th the top three things that came out of my office was, Time, the time it took to issue the key, um, and well, that key guy's not here anymore. Jason's pretty quick. To be, be exact, I have a, <coughs> here's a case in point. Before I came up here, a young lady walked in with a key, the metal key that she needed to have coffee. I think it was like 11:15. I, I was walking up to get my annual sandwich, my daily sandwich from the atrium. <coughs> And that was 11.15, I walked back in the office after getting it all done at 11.30, and Rudy was walking back in with the key already. So I think, I think the key making process, the metal, as long as we don't have to go out and order the key blank, so will we happen at 24 hours, unless it's a special key, and then we have to go out and order. We requested that one. I don't want to bore the students with this kind of talk, because yeah. they probably have more. But research. yeah, the survey, I really didn't see the survey. I really didn't look at the statewide survey. I know the survey we sent out had to do with accessing the bill, had to do with accessing key issuing. Mm -hmm. And then there was a visibility question, not so much about public safety, because people thought that since I've been here, we've been more visible than invisible. Mm -hmm. And then um, they wanted to sort the see new one. And then, I can't remember what the third one was, but I don't think it was, if I can't remember, then the other was in the third one. As far as students are concerned, I've been here three years mm -hmm. and have not had any surveys whatsoever regarding any safety or security issues sent to the students. Most of the surveys, if I, you know, I have Citrus account because I also uh, work for the school, so I get to read what's sent to the employees as in the old staff emails, and I get to see, and I have the student as email well account, student. so I get to see what's sent specifically to the students on the Seattle um, Central .edu account. Yeah. On that account, we had two surveys. One had to do with changing our name, another one had to do with smoking, and that's it in three years. Because so. I wonder how students feel about their safety here. If they feel safe on campus in general. Your student. Your student? Yes. 
Do you feel safe? Weren't you in that class that I talked to? Oh, or no, no, but uh, it's similar. Similar yeah. class? Okay. Do you feel safe here? I hate to put you on the spot. Uh, for the most part, yeah. For the most part, yeah. For the, what's, the most, what's the most part no, then? I'm in this garage at night. <coughs> what makes it a little uneasy? Yeah, what makes you here? feel a little bit uneasy? that if you saw that, and if you called my security office number, my public safety office number, which I'll get to you in a second, and my officers will come out and talk to these people and get them moving along, because I'm pretty certain there are there are a population that likes to be here overnight and leave before the sun comes up, they might be able to talk to their homeless. Um, and my officers probably know that, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, that's good information to know, because if it's affecting you, it's affecting other students. It scares me too when I walk out the, yeah. on the sidewalk and somebody comes up this, and they're like ranting, you know, and they're, yeah. they're just like, yeah. Call us. <coughs> Kelly, you can call us. Call us. Remember when Rachel and me made the presentation about the veterans' if uh, issues? Yeah. Rachel is one of our student veterans. She takes most of the afternoon and evening classes. She made a good point that getting back to the garage in the evening mm -hmm. is always been a major adventure for most of us. And I don't take, I don't drive, so I can't answer that one. I take the bus. But it, as it gets darker, it gets more interesting outside the doors. It really does. It's, yeah. you know, and that's the one thing, you know, that's the one serious, that's the one thing we, I mean, I take serious security 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right. seriously. In the wintertime, the things you need to remember is it gets darker earlier, it stays darker longer. And, you know, my bottom line to that whole thing and what I've talked to people about is, when we were kids, you, you knew when you were getting in trouble, you had that sixth sense. Mm -hmm. As we get older, we, we dispel that feeling. And I, I, when I gave this presentation to classrooms and to, fac to faculty meetings every once in a while, I, I tell the story about when I was a cop. And I was driving a Ford Explorer, or a Ford Explorer, excuse me. And I was doing 90 miles an hour, I was going to a call as a sheriff's deputy, and I was working North Clark County out of Vancouver, Washington, I was down there with man boy up in the, up in the sticks. And I was coming 90 miles an hour around this corner, and as I was getting ready to go around the corner and explore, I thought I had this fleeting moment that I better slow down, and I don't know why. It was that sixth sense. And as I came around the corner and slowed down, there was a 1,500 pound bull elk standing in the middle of the road. And I was <laughs> like, that's a good reason to slow down. And so it was a decision time, and it was a split second decision time, to either hit 1,500 pounds of elk at 90 miles an hour, which it's not the impact that kills you, but the sudden speed. It's not the sudden stop, it's continual motion that will hurt you. I took the ditch. And so I put my exploder in the ditch and it rolled and I lived. But I started thinking about all the times that I had that sixth sense after I was a kid and how each time it actually saved my life or stopped me from doing something stupid. We as adults don't believe in that sixth sense anymore. You gotta get back to them. If you feel, if you feel, if you, you know, us men are always taught you don't cry, you know, is, is, uh, we used to buy used to boost. And you know, if we get back to that feeling again of this just doesn't feel right, I need to take make a call, mm -hmm. I need to take a step back and take a look. It only takes a second. Because I can tell you that happened to me twice on two different roads up outside of Celestian Prairie, and I know you guys don't even know where the heck I'm talking about. And each time it was an elk in the middle of the road, and each time I wrecked my car. But I knew it was coming because I had that feeling that something wasn't right. So if you take that take that into account in your daily routines, I see. Can I ask a little more about Sarah? Is that your Sarah? Yeah, about Sarah's question. Mm -hmm. So you said if you see someone that you feel uncomfortable around, just call you. But does that is that just this block? If I'm across the street. If you're at the Mac, if you're on any Seattle Central College campus. Okay. I think what you need to realize is, and I got corrected just a little bit. Seattle Central College should have an S on it. They should have told me that when I applied for this job three years ago. Um, because we have an Aerotown Academy as part of Seattle Central College. Mm -hmm. We have the Wood Technology Center, which is part of Seattle yeah. Central College. Mm -hmm. And SBI is affiliated with us, but they have their own college number. I found that out So I have literally four campuses. Mm -hmm. 
plus a district office <laughs> that I have to provide security for. And Joel and I have a meeting we're kind of laughing at each other. But what our geolocation, as far as my campus goes, is I have a map hanging in my office. And I kind of, in my mind, I know exactly where campus is at. So something happened on the sidewalk over there at the cash machine. I'd want to know about it. Um, it's not going to be a crime step for me because that's not campus, but it's a little close to campus. Something happened at the bookstore or for the bookstore or for the Mac. That's campus. It belongs to me. There's something so, happening there all every day. On the backside, on Nagel, we don't, you know. They're going through that pathway I know, there. I know, yeah. But, yeah, you know, if you're close to campus, call us. I mean, well, you know, we'll tell, you know, if you say I'm standing right outside of Panera, mm -hmm. you're close enough to my house. Mm -hmm. If you say you're standing in the middle of Cal Anderson Park, I'm standing in front of Rite Aid. If you're in front of Rite Aid, it's Walgreens. 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 Yeah, yeah. Rite Aid, Walgreens are public property. That's not our jurisdiction. Well, Rite Aid is way farther than this college. That's yeah. uh, If you're at the North Plaza or the parking lot behind North Plaza, that's case. Because I made a call in the past. It was uh, in front of GameStop right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the officer said, like, well, you're going to have to call the police, and we'll call as well. Mm -hmm. But that's outside yeah. of our area. Yeah. It is. It's public It's public property adjacent to the campus. Yeah. Now, if there's a full blow fight going on there, I I, I know I know several officers that have done it. They've seen, seen the altercation yeah. going on, responded to assist, and calm it down while police were responding. Because we had a situation that was happening right in front of Panera last spring where Noah and Shiro got in, yeah. were there, and all of a sudden the guys went off on some other guy, and the fight started, and then it was a bad thing. to have Noah, who was a former boxer, get involved with it. Noah hit one of the guys that was in a fight and knocked him out. And then sure was poor pulling out the O pepper spray and three SVD units came up and said, we'll handle it. Yeah, go back to campus. And Noah's going, I just need us to go back to campus. You're blanking this up. I'm going back to campus. <laughs> <laughs> Any war stories need to be blanked up. Yes, ma'am. So first of all, how many officers do you have? And secondly, uh, it sounds like you've tightened up a bit. Uh, because sometimes I used to call it, it was sort of like an indifferent response. And also, we have certain uh, computer labs. I, I work for the SL Department of mm -hmm. Basic Studies, and mm -hmm. I used to find security officers in there surfing. I know. Okay. I have, you're in the I have two at Wood Tech that are full time. <coughs> I didn't go back to my website. Um, Tracy Noah. <laughs> I have Shiro as a sergeant, Tracy Noah, Joel, oh, you're making a name of all Nels, Adrian, How did I forget it? Okay. We have seven on campus. We're hiring a we're hiring a fill position now for for a person that resigned. So I have eight full time here. Um, I have about six part timers that work weekends and off. Before I came here, we only had coverage till midnight, and then we were dead. we were not covered from midnight to five. And when I had over 20 overhead projectors till my first six months I was here, we actually went to 24-second coverage and, and kind of helped with the crime problem. Um, <clears throat> so we truly have a 24-7, 365 coverage now. There will be an officer on campus every day of the week, Monday through Friday, holidays, and all that. Um, there will be someone here. Uh, my budget, my, my salary budget has expanded. It's in the, there's a million square feet in this building. This building alone. <laughs> you know, so yeah, we have 24-7. Uh, Monday, pretty much Monday through Friday, there's full-time coverage on everything. And then on Saturday, Sunday nights, I have an additional part-timer that works over in the graveyard and does the parking issues in the parking garage and all that, all that stuff that goes on over there in the weekends. So we're holding a part-timer there. But yeah, we have a better coverage. We have a better philosophy. We have better missions and goals. If I have to be, I can be very micro, but it drives me crazy to be a micromanager. It really does. I don't have time to micromanage my people and they understand that. So I'm a macro manager. And you won't find one of my officers in the computer lab server. People. Because well, this I'm, I'm, pretty, for you, so. I'm pretty easy going and laid back on the outside, but if I hear about that kind of stuff, I have a very strong father son and father daughter conversation with whoever's happening in the office room. Lost that conversation and it won't happen again because it's not. Um, 
It's changed a lot in three years. I know that. I mean, I've had conversations with people, and they, I think, have appreciated the changes we have. And I think we're actually moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. That was one reason I think I was asked to come to work here. Mm -hmm. and I think that was one reason I was asked to apply. Mm -hmm. I was actually sought out to apply. I was, I was called by my ministry to apply to this job. I didn't find this job online. We stole you from them. We stole you from Mm -hmm. Renton stole me from Bellevue with the opportunity to build a program there, and then somehow I got a phone call from from here, a phone call from here, saying the position was open. I think we have a question. Well, yeah, he's, he works for me, so I yeah, I'm going to get a quick Yeah, it's about, it's, it's about integrity. It's, it's you know you hire you hire good officers. You know I, I, I stay humble, but I stay strong. Um, Are you an officer? Yeah, I worked at Wood Tech. I've been there for a few months. I was a, I ran into Sergeant Shiro. I was a student here for five quarters. And and I was glad to get part time doing it. And I thank you for the part time work. But I take it seriously. I don't sit in the office. I do walk in. I take people's safety and security. You know, I'm not Seattle Police Department, that's things out of my hands. But I keep an eye on the place and I don't I don't play games on it. And I'm just you know, so I don't well, I think what people need to realize is, is the process to hire part-timers is the same process we use to hire part-timers. The part-timers go through the district now to apply for a part-time hourly job. Whereas in the past, my predecessors would just have you, you know, someone would walk in and say, I want to apply for a job and have a paper application to fill it out if I felt like you were a good fit to your end. Uh, now they have to actually fill out the same application on the yoga like a full-timer, and they go into the part-time pool, they give us a resume and a cover letter. And then I go out and lean it and look through the list, and I get the list kind of shortened up, and I send it to Shiro, who's my sergeant. And Shiro handles all the part-timers. I have nothing to do with the part-timers. Shiro will say, I want to hire Kevin, I want to hire Marvin, I want to hire, we're going to be hiring a young man named Ulysses here pretty soon, I want to hire Ulysses. I said, you know, you've got to supervise them. Do what you need to do. I might have a conversation. I think Kevin and I talked for about 15, 20 minutes one day before you get hired. But I leave it on sure to do. Um, my officers make a pretty good wage um, to do what they do. Um, they start out a little bit lower than the $15 an hour, but after about a year, they'll make $17 an hour to work for 16 hours a day. My part-time hourly officers are not treated any different than my full-time officers. They're campus security officers, public safety officers, for the institution. They all get treated the same because they are the same. There's nothing different. You know, one just works 23 more hours, 23 more hours. So, yes, ma'am. So I know you work with the safety committee, right? Mm -hmm. and do we have a plan? Are we going to have training for what to do if a, kid, a shooter comes in? I offered training. What was it? Whenever you guys got that 3% budget cut thing, you guys had the 3% salary reduction. I offered training over the summer every Friday. For active shooters. Faculty aren't there in the summer necessarily. I know. And I offer training. I mean, I'm available. Faculty are the ones who are going to be in charge of the classroom situation. So when I've are we going to make time faculty. as a campus to make sure that all faculty know what to do in that kind of a situation? You need to talk to the faculty center. I'm on the faculty center. I talked to Rob. I was up there the other day. They think the college should be having a plan. They should, they should actually, if they want to do it, call me. You set, you set a day apart on one of these days that needs to be booked five years out, and I'll be more than happy to bring it. I'm a trainer. I can train on active shooter. I can train on bullying. <coughs> I can train on safe packages for travel. I mean, the Center but for the Personal administration doesn't feel that responsible. I don't think the, I don't think the administration is against it. I but, think, uh, yeah, but I there, think but what it is. Somebody has to have that responsibility. It's my responsibility. Sentence. It's my responsibility to train. I think the faculty and the, and the groups that want it need just to get together and figure out a time to do it. Yeah. You know, the safety committee, I'm on the safety committee. 
He's on the safety committee. Yep. They do a great deal of talking. Yeah. Quite a lot of action. Don't tape it. No, Don't tape need, that. That's where it needs to go. <laughs> there isn't a lot Susan's of action. Susan's on, and she brings back a lot of information. She does, She's but great. there's a, I mean, there's a whole lot of talking, and, and you know, like most committees, there's, you know, and the safety committee really, they don't think they have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. But the safety committee does have a little bit of teeth because the president rolls into the safety committee. Um, and I, you know, what I would say is, if, you know, if the library wants to have a conversation about active shooters, that it is. It's 90 minutes, I'd say two hours. Um, there's a pre-conversation, there's the video, there's a DVD, we can do it in here. Um, and there's a post-conversation about that. And, you know, it also talks about personal preparedness, because the bottom line is you're not going to be any good to me or the college or yourself until you have your personal plan. You know, people laugh at me, but when I was married, this, this I've been married but my last wife, we had a double. Uh, Abby is a world's sweetest soccer spaniel. Uh, she has a few health issues. My dog has a three-day, three-way kid. My dog has, and she is my dog because I have park in, in, the, in the divorce decree, I get custody rights and visitation to my dog. I'm not lying, I bring the papers to school. Anyway, she has pills. And so I made a three-day, three-way kit for her. Her favorite, her favorite blankets are in there, a bunch of rawhides are in there, um, medications in there. Um, there's four, four liters of water in there, and it's in a little tub. Yeah. Julie has one, yeah. and I used to have it. Now that Julie lives right down the street. Have them in the too. But this is for my puppy. Okay, I have no kids, so but I have a, you know I have enough supplies at my my new house for four, two kids and two adults to survive at least a week. You know, I, our freezer always has stuff in it. We have two camp stoves. You know, am I a survivalist, doomsday type guy? No, but I, I, I practice what I preach. In my truck, I have a red bag that has a change of clothes and a bunch of stuff in it. To the extreme, I have slippers underneath my bed so when the earthquake happens and the windows break, I don't cut my feet on the back. Yeah. Little things you don't think about. What I'm trying to say is if you're not prepared at home you know, with your family, you're going to worry more about them than the scenarios happening here. We're going to have an earthquake, or a mudslide, or a massive, mu massive man, uh, natural disaster, or before we have a man-made situation. So when the when the Howard Hanson Dam does decide to break, because it is going to break someday, um, it's going to flush and knock out one. Do you need something new to worry about? I don't even yeah. know about that. <laughs> Howard Hanson is up around Red Mary, and it comes down the you know, river and all this kind of stuff. But you need to have those plans. You know, two years ago they had the big well, stuff. Where's the Howard Hanson Dam? Up the Green River. It's up the Green River. And it's going to burst. And well, there was a grass. It's an earthen dam. It's no. not concrete. But it'll affect you trying to get it. south because it takes that a lot. But you need to have your personal plan. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. that's part of the plan. I have a phone plan. I have a phone plan and all that kind of stuff. I got a couple questions. If you have time after this.